I've been playing Chained Echoes because you have no time to game. <laughs> Welcome to my When the Credits Roll series, a series that came about to give you, the wonderful viewer, a bit of faith in the review. As you know, that when you see these words, When the Credits Roll, you know that I played through the game enough to see the end credits at least. Before we start the review, just a couple of quick details about the game itself. The game was developed by Matthias Linder and published by Deck 13. It was released on the 8th of December 2022, and it took me roughly 40 hours to complete. So onto the game itself. Chained Echoes is an interesting beast. It's mostly the work of one guy, Matthias Linder, and created over several years of dedicated work, culminating in even Microsoft taking note and helping out by dropping it on Game Pass. Matthias's creation takes a lot of inspiration from the classic JRPGs of old, such as Chrono Trigger, Xenogears, Final Fantasy, etc., and incorporates them all with its own little spin. So it's not to make it a clone. Chain Echoes has come out to a lot of acclaim and has developed quite the rabid fan base. But is it deserving of all this praise? Well, let's have a look. First up, the story. Set in the war-torn continent of Valandis, Chain Echoes' story starts with Glenn and his buddy Killian as part of a disgraced mercenary band that are attempting a suicide mission to earn back their honour. And after some rough fights, they find their goal, a crystal. It's meant to power the artillery of the enemy nation. But upon Glenn destroying it, it explodes, vaporising thousands of people in a massive explosion. This one act, though, ends the long-standing war and a treaty is made. And a year later, a celebration of peace is being held. But political machinations going on in the background aim to turn this celebration into a new cause for war. And even with the best efforts of Glenn and the group he slowly gathers, war seems inevitable. But this is only the beginning, as in a classic JRPG fashion, Ancient evils, possibly evil churches, and some gods all get involved, and this merry band must face them all to save their continent. The story is quite solid overall, with some very interesting twists and turns, and doesn't let up very often. But no game is a game without its gameplay. The draw of this sort of game, like Chained Echoes, is the classic feel, but even in drawing on that retro console RPG feel, games tend to have their own twist, and this one is no different. So while the battles are very traditional, you and your enemies are lined up on each side of the screen with the classic options like attack, skill, item, defend, and run away, that all would work like you'd expect. Attacks hit the enemies, skills use one of your available skills or, or magic, and depletes some resource, in this game's case, TP or technical points. Defends buff your defense for a turn, and items that you use one of the large sort of items and run away, well, that's your escape battle. So it's, it's all very classic in styling but there are other bits and pieces to it so first up when you've actually selected a target the game is nice enough to show you their strength and weaknesses uh, which is really useful because it it allows you to determine what attacks you want to use because there's lots of different types and obviously using the right type will do more damage um, but if they're strong against it it reduces damage as you'd expect it'll also show you if an item can be stolen or if they can be canned, which is an interesting and very specific to one character that I'm not going to spoil. Um, both of these, though, are skills. So stealing lets you the additional items. And yeah, canned is something else. Chain Echoes also has an overdrive mechanic. This is a gauge that goes up and down depending on what has happened. It has three sections on it. So yellow, which doesn't have any effect. Green is when you're in the overdrive state and your defense is better, your attacks do more damage and skills cost half the amount of TP. And then red section when you've overheated where you take more damage and skills cost more TP. This is managed by a skill type. This is managed by a skill type being displayed at the top left of the screen. Uh, and when you use the skill it's showing, the overdrive mechanic goes down. Defending and swapping characters and such and certain items can also reduce the gauge but everything else tends to send it upwards so attacking or being hit can all send your gauge upwards so you have to so there's a lot of um, effort there in maintaining that bar because you'll be doing things like you want to use an attack that's effective against the enemy but they might be strong against it but it will reduce your overdrive bar which will stop it going to an overheat 
meaning it's actually a safer bet to do the less damage so you, you don't take more damage by being overheated. Stuff like that. It can also bring in like healing, because healing is one of the things that can reduce it, or push you over, and sometimes you need to heal. So if your character's about to die, but you're about to push your overdrive bar up, do you heal? Well, all choices, all choices. It definitely makes some decision-making a bit more interesting than just spamming your most powerful moves over and over. Uh, your most powerful moves that can't be spammed are actually your ultimate moves. Each character has their own fancy attack that's tied to yet another gauge uh, that, that once full can be used. Kind of like your yeah, Final Fantasy VII style Limit Breaker-esque mechanic, but it's one bar for every character. As in, only one character can use the bar and it gets depleted. Each character has their own special variant of this. It's worth trying each character out at least once to see what they do, so you can plan better in the future when you want to use ones. I find, personally, I tended to use one character's over everyone else's, and that was Glenn's, just because of its effects. And it was, for most of the game, I just used his ultimate move, especially on bosses. Um, a little extra note as well. Sometimes you see enemies that are sparkling, uh, these little blighters will net your extra loot when you defeat them, which is always cool. So keep an eye out for them. When prepping for battle, you can only take four members into the battle, but they can each bring a buddy that can be swapped in and out of the battle for free. And it reduces your overdrive bar, so it's pretty useful. So that means each character slot becomes more versatile, as you effectively have two in each slot. So when someone's heavily injured or out of TP, you can swap them in for a hopefully fresh buddy. Or... Um, sometimes enemies stagger you, which means you have to swap them out, or you can't use them. And it all keeps the battle flowing and gives you more and more choice. It's just, it's, it seems to be a lot in this game about decision making and flexibility in the combat system, which is, which is really nice. So, setting up the characters themselves, each character firstly has four item slots. Weapon, armour, accessory, which are all pretty self-explanatory. But then you have a class emblem. Uh, items that you find by praying at magical statues and then defeating the battle that they set out for you. These emblems give your characters kind of a class. And what that means in this game is the there's two extra slots for skills, um, two for your active and passive skills, that you can put in these class-specific skills. Um, they can be filled out with your normal skills from just that character but by activating like having these class emblems they get a stat buff and these special skills if you want to use them the skill system outside of the class element skills is quite interesting and it's tied into the character progression as you don't have levels in this game each character has their own specific specific set of tiered skill levels so and the options within can be purchased using Rimoir Shards. They're obtained by killing bosses and a couple of other ways. One shard equals one point for every character. So, which is kind of cool. So every character is always the same level. Um, using the shard, you can select a new active skill, which is like attacks, heals, passive skills, which might be like resistances or immunities and such or just a straight up stat buff and every character has their own unique set and basically in each tier once you purchase enough of the skills you unlock the next tier giving you even more options doesn't stop you purchasing stuff from the previous tier though so you still have all the choices you can get everything you want from each tier and on top of this every now and again when you use one of the shards no matter what you purchase you get a bunch of stat upgrades stat buffs it's kind of like um it's almost like hitting a new level in a game when you see a load of the numbers go up so i mean i've never quite figured out exactly when this happens but it happens and it's always useful but now you purchase the skills for each character each character has a limited number of skills that can actually equip so your stat buffs are always active but you're you've got a set number of active and passive skills you can take and they're separated out so so you equip then into your skills menu the skills you want to take, whether the active or the passives. These can then be upgraded themselves, every skill having three levels, um, which is upgraded by using SP. So by just by having stuff, a skill equipped, 
it will gain SP itself and level up by just being in battles. But your characters also gain SP in like a, a each each character has an individual pool of their own, which you can then spend extra on top of the naturally accumulating skills, meaning you can upgrade the skills faster that you want to and get them up to their level three maxed out. Or if you've got a new skill, you might have a, a pool of um, points left over to use to push them up quickly, as opposed to having to wait to use them a lot and go through a load of battles. Right, still carrying on. On top of all this, we have a quest system. Um, you get, got your normal main and side quests that you just collect by doing the usual routine. But there's also a reward board hidden in the journal menu. Um, this has a series of goals to achieve in each area. It usually amounts to kill X amount of one enemy or kill the unique enemies in an area. Unique enemies being like a, a one-time map super boss type dealo. Or collecting X number of chests, finding buried treasure, which can be found using special markers that point in different directions. You've got to figure out which arrows lead to actual treasure. Or finding bandit treasure that's usually hidden behind breakable walls. Or even finding the statues that get you class emblems. So many little random bits and pieces on each area to achieve um, on this reward board. And these reward boards net you some money, usually, and then some items um, from achieving them. And it's also another, it's a way of, um, the more of these are linked up, as in like next to each other in a chain, you can then unlock grimoire shards and such as well. So it's worth worth checking out and making sure you're doing things, especially getting them all to link. So a lot of the items you get from the reward board and from beating enemies are pretty much pointless items. Um, they don't have any purpose beyond selling to a merchant. Uh, but what they do when you do sell these items to the merchant is they unlock deals, which is a one-time special purchase, gives you some fancy items as opposed to what you can normally buy in the shop. And this is where you get some of the like more powerful weapons and armors and such is locked behind these deals. Uh, junk anyway, so there's no point in not selling them. And the extra money is always handy. Uh, to go along with merchants, we find anvils, which you can do blacksmithing. Uh, this allows you to upgrade weapons and armor. That's kind of like the most simple. It's just using some of the materials, other materials you find in chests or beating enemies and money. You can just make the item stronger. But you also get crystals, which are, again, found in random places, or giant glowing rocks that are around the map. Uh, these crystals each have a special ability, and they can be merged together with crystals of a matching type, and then slotted into weapons and armor. The higher the grade of the, like the more you've upgraded the weapon or piece of armor, the more slots they have meaning the more crystals you can put in, the more special effects that you can give the armor and weapon. But what's really cool is even though these take up like, like the slots, crystal slots, so some crystals might take up two or even three of your crystal slots, if you get a shiny new piece of weapon or equipment and you don't want to waste your crystals, you can just pop them out and put them back into your new item. And obviously, the more you merge the crystals together, the higher the level of the crystal, like a greater the buff it provides. So keep your eye out for those glowing rocks. There's even a fast travel system that unlocks as you progress by finding other giant glowing stones in the map. It unlocks fast travel points on the map. But wait, there's more. There's yet another battle system, and that's using sky armors. What's a sky armor? It's a giant robotic armor, like a mech some of you guys can pilot. Firstly, on most maps, you can just summon this majestic machine to traverse the land in one of two modes. Hover, where you act like a normal person, but because you're hovering, you can float over water. Or fly mode, which lets you just zip around the map with no obstacles standing in your way, except when you need to land. There's certain like areas that you can't land in, such as water or tall grass and stuff. In battle, we have a bit of a difference. Firstly, sky armor's hit a lot harder. So those normal enemies you've been fighting, a sky will probably kill it in one hit. These are designed to fight the bigger enemies and some bosses and such. Uh, 
each sky armor doesn't use your skills of your character but it's based on the weapons you've equipped onto your sky armor of which they can carry two which gives you up to eight skills for each sky armor um, more of these skills are unlocked by using the sky armor and unlocking proficiency kind of like your sp skills get an sp for your skills where it builds up over time so the more you use it the faster you'll get these abilities other than this they act quite similar in battle except you can't switch out party members because we only have four armors what you do instead is you switch gears and depending on which of the three gears you're in has a different effect in battle and on the altered overdrive bar gear one you deal and receive normal damage and the overdrive bar moves to the right gear two you deal and receive more damage but skills also cost more tp and the overdrive bar moves to the left gear zero you can't use any skills deal normal damage by using standard attack and gain a lot of tp back the overdrive bar doesn't move at all so yeah it's a lot of manager maintenance there with using the switch gears stuff and it's really interesting because the sky arm battles are quite different using a similar setup to the normal battles adding that variety there's also a tidbit that comes into the game play a bit later on don't want to spoil too much but you eventually unlock a base and along with that you get the ability to recruit people from around the world to join you and some of them are just odd you also get more side quests which are also can be pretty weird and wonderful along with this you gain an airship which allows you to fly around the world map as opposed to using the menu based map to teleport open up even more places by using the airship because discovering them on the maps um so yeah it's just a lot to discover and see and a lot going on for better or worse so what is actually good about the game well firstly the art needs to be mentioned as it's fantastic and varied a lot of love and attention has been placed in pretty much everything from the characters to the environment and it all really comes through there's so much variety there from inhuman character designs to like the environments they're not just your standard water ice fire levels in a volcano in a swamp there it's it's a, wondering what you're going to see next is a great driver to keep playing the game because like I said, the environments are so different uh, and unique in this game and something else something i don't usually talk about is the soundtracks because i'm not really a sound person i have the musical talent of a brick going through a window but the soundtrack in this game really kind of hit me in a way it made me feel very reminiscent of Final fantasy games i'm not sure if that was their intended feel but that's what i got from it but again i'm not the biggest music person the story is also enjoyable and it really ramps up towards the end with some interesting twists and turns it was another thing that kept me going um, through the game as well as wanting to see the next environments and then you have the overdrive mechanic which adds an interesting layer to the normal combat flow um, especially between the person and sky combat and the differences between them so it's just kind of like that variety and everything that keeps you going oh and heavy metal turtle racing but no game is perfect so what are the negatives in this one um the first one is might just be a me thing and it to others it might just be a, a small thing but the lack of a mini map drove me insane having to constantly go in and out of the menu oh man oh drove me nuts and i don't know why it just it just really did especially because the game's so heavy on exploration this leads us to exploration every area is large and this is both a good and bad in a sense in that there's plenty to do and for people that love that like the treasure hunter mentality and the exploring mentality it's great but it can feel like it artificially extends some sections which is a little frustrating um because there aren't that many battles like especially compared to games with like random encounters and such that there's the battles are quite infrequent in a sense unless you go looking for them. but thinking about the battles um maybe not having too many is a good thing because it's got the every battle is a puzzle mentality 
um, which is a design we've seen more and more in games recently, which turns your average on the road battle into more of a larger encounter where you have to think about what you're doing a bit more than you normally did instead of just hitting the attack button over and over. So because of that, the battles are extended a little bit longer than normal. Not quite as bad as some other games that have come out recently, but still, they do take a bit of time. And you never, because you don't have the level mechanic, you never feel like you're like a superhero power level where you just smash through the enemy. You're always kind of at the level you're meant to be for the area. Um, so it always makes the next area that bit of a slog to get through. But you do, like, without a doubt, when you go back to all the areas... You do feel a bit like a superhero and just smash through the enemies because you have actually got stronger you just never really feel it if you just play through the game in a normal order um and because of the every battle is a puzzle mentality as well the battles can feel a bit long-winded um, which can be a bit draining if you're just trying to get to the next story segment but add on top of that a lot of the characters feel a bit one trick pony like the one that poisons is going to be that's going to be their job. The one that like hits the magic weakness is always going to be your magic weakness person. I mean, you do get more characters and they do mix up it a bit, so you get that variety. But I always it felt like every character was steamrolled into one direction. And I'm going to say it, I miss levels. As usual, before looking at my final thoughts, let's have a look at what the critics thought. We're going to look at the PC version because that's the one I played. And on Metacritic, we see it was given a 91 by critics and an 8.7 or 87 by the users. That's definitely high praise indeed and possibly one of the highest scoring RPGs of 2022. And it's not that I don't agree with the rating. I personally would give it a slightly lower score, but I completely understand why it has scored this well. So my final thoughts are it's a very solid game and impressive that it was mostly done by one person. It definitely invokes that nostalgia feeling for like your Super Nintendo, early PlayStation era RPGs. I wasn't completely sold on the progression and skill system. Like I said, it made the characters feel a bit one trick pony, but the story did grab me by the end and the drive and drove me to seeing the credits. Add on with the environments and how interesting they are it kept me going the battle system itself is very interesting and i like the variety in it even if i don't like the every battle is a puzzle mentality so overall does it deserve the praise that's been heaped at its feet yes i believe that it does for me personally it's a solid game but not the best thing ever but i do understand the praise it's been given so my rating is must play.